Just this week, I've taken my first dose of Moderna Koof Proof. That's right, folks. I believe in vaccines. Over the course of my military service, I was vaccinated against practically everything, from childhood diseases to smallpox to even anthrax, and I normally take the flu vaccine every year. If we're ever going to get back to normal, we have to achieve herd immunity, and vaccines are the best way to get there. Meanwhile, back in Washington, Biden has proposed another round of stimulus. I must say that I have some definite thoughts about it, too. Let's talk about that, shall we? The first portion of Biden's stimulus contains that part that many people have been watching for, a stimulus check. Biden proposed a round of $1,400 stimulus checks, and this time the stimulus won't exclude college students and other adult dependents. Most regular Americans have been looking for this stimulus since late last year, when the Senate ignored both the White House and the House of Representatives to pass a $600 stimulus. Biden proposed that there would be $2,000 in stimulus per person if he were elected, not $600. So naturally, there's some serious debate going on again. Most of the GOP and a few Dems are arguing that a stimulus check financed by more bonds being issued is less effective than ending lockdowns and letting the economy get back up to speed. Some progressives are seizing on the number 2000 though, demanding that the new round of stimulus be $2,000 in addition to the $600 which was just sent out. I have to say that if the country is to remain on lockdown, these stimulus checks will be necessary to keep the working class in America solvent while they weather the crisis. But, and this is a big exception to my support of stimulus checks, the lockdowns have to end, and soon. The GOP is perfectly correct that the U.S. cannot keep issuing bonds to fund stimulus checks indefinitely. The national debt exploded last year. Unemployment spiked, and quite frankly, a lot of those jobs are already gone forever thanks to the heavy impact that lockdowns had on small businesses. And as for those who are demanding that $2,000 means a new round of $2,000 checks instead of $1,400, well, your opportunistic attempt to force through a higher amount is noted. I also have to wonder who sets these figures for the checks, too. Were these amounts carefully calculated to provide the average amount of lost income, or were they arbitrarily decided? I prefer a calculated stimulus to an arbitrary stimulus myself because of that explosive growth in debt. Besides which, if the amount is arbitrary, then what's to say that the next round won't be $3,000 per person, or $4,000, or even more? Won't that just make the argument that everyone should have a universal basic income check regardless as to their employment status easier to pass? Rapidly rising unemployment sucks, especially when employment figures were looking great right up until the COVID crisis. Just in January, over 2 million people have lost their jobs and national unemployment has reached well over 10 million people, not including those who were considered by the government to have left the labor force entirely. Unemployment benefits are usually half of full wages, too. But I don't understand the need to plus up unemployment benefits across the board, especially with all of the other provisions being included in every stimulus package. Biden wants to push the plus up to $400 a week, $100 more per week than people are receiving from the federal government now. Now let's do some math. The highest minimum wage in the U.S. is D.C.'s $15 per hour. At full time, that's $600 per week. U.S. unemployment pays a reduced amount based on how long someone works. If the previously mentioned worker earned D.C. minimum wage in 2020, then they would qualify for $300 a week in benefits for up to six months. A $300 plus-up puts them at full wages, so the proposed plus-up would actually put them at $100 more per week in benefits than they were earning from their job. That means that everyone who earned up to $20 per hour for the previous six months will actually receive as much or more in unemployment benefits as they received working. And I have to say that doesn't sound like an incentive to go back to work before those benefits expire at all. I also have to point out that this money is also being funded by more national debt. Capping plussed up benefits to match 100% of lost wages makes more sense than just adding an extra $400 and would probably cost the taxpayers a lot less in the long run. With all of these extra unemployment benefits and stimulus checks, most people should be able to pay their rent even if they lost their jobs due to COVID lockdowns. At least I would think that. 
but Congress has already authorized $25 billion in rental assistance and issued a moratorium on evictions and foreclosures. Biden is asking for another $30 billion for those programs, plus another $5 billion in legal assistance for those facing foreclosure. Personally, I learned a long time ago that the first bill paid each month is always the rent or house payment. But it seems that there are more than a few people out there who either didn't learn this basic principle or who choose to ignore it. I realize that for gig workers and the self-employed small business owner, unemployment benefits really aren't as accessible even if they are available. But helping those out who lost that income should be much less expensive than that. Also, and I just have to ask this, why did rent go up 40% in New York State in 2020? Why does an apartment in Nevada cost 41% more now than a year ago? Alaska, Arkansas, Iowa, Kansas, Louisiana, Michigan, Missouri, Montana, New Mexico, Ohio, Rhode Island, South Carolina, Tennessee, Texas, Virginia, and Washington also experienced rent increases in excess of 5% last year. Why? Shouldn't those states be trying to keep their average rents from going up during the crisis? That would be a much more effective way to help people to avoid homelessness right now, don't you think? Biden seeks to extend the 15% bump in monthly SNAP benefits, too. Now, increased funding to make sure that people have access to the program makes sense, but increasing the monthly individual benefit by 15%? Not really. Keeping those programs solvent shouldn't involve bigger checks. It should involve more accessibility for those who need it. Biden wants to increase the child tax credit and to make it fully refundable. I can't support such tax credits even though I'd probably qualify for them. Schemes like this are designed to transfer wealth directly from the upper middle class to lower income families, and I don't think that the government should be in the business of redistributing wealth. Biden's also proposed universal paid sick leave and family leave. Now that I can get behind, as many people have been stuck choosing between paying their bills on time and caring for their illnesses properly for a long time now. I realize that this will result in more payroll costs on paper. But productivity actually goes up when employees have access to reasonable amounts of leave to get over being sick, or to care for their dependents when they become sick. But then we come to the biggest hidden figure in the stimulus package, a $15 federal minimum wage. There are some features that I like about this proposal, like abolishing the differences between regular employees, tipped employees, and youth employees in minimum wage rates. However, Most states do not have a $15 minimum wage, and many states have minimum wage rates set at the much lower $7.25 per hour that's the current federal rate. I don't see how small businesses already under pressure from lockdowns will be helped by increasing pressure on their payrolls, especially in conjunction with a new federal requirement to provide paid sick leave and family leave to all employees. We've already lost millions of jobs and hundreds of thousands of businesses to COVID. Is this really the time to implement such a sweeping change? Oh yeah, that's right. The states most affected by a change in minimum wage voted for Trump, didn't they? The sweeping overhaul in the minimum wage is seen as necessary in order to ensure that all wage earners are able to obtain a living wage. Now, a living wage is a rate of hourly pay in which all families would be able to afford a basic but decent standard of living. Currently, the living wage is calculated to be just over $16 per hour nationally. Local conditions are different, though. Arkansas, with the lowest state living wage, would surpass a living wage by nearly $0.75 per hour, even with a single-income minimum wage household. Hawaii, on the other hand, would still not reach their local living wage of nearly $37 per hour, even with two full-time minimum wage workers in the household. This also doesn't address the fact that underage dependents living at home would also earn nearly a living wage when in most cases such employees don't need to pay living expenses. Minimum wage is supposed to be a starting point, folks. If it's set too high, then big businesses will move as much of their operations to countries with lower wages as they can manage. The first minimum wage in the United States was $0.25 per hour, a figure equivalent to $4.65 in current U.S. dollar purchasing power. That means that the current $7.25 minimum wage is already at least 55% more purchasing power than the first minimum wage, and $15 per hour would have more than three times the purchasing power. Over the same time span, the median wage has risen from $0.65 per hour to nearly $30 per hour. If we raise minimum wage to $15 per hour, then median wages will have less than twice the purchasing power of minimum wage. Or to put it a bit more bluntly, 
the premium paid for education experience and efficiency will be decreased to below the premium paid when minimum wages were first introduced. Perhaps, then, we should consider what we can do to increase the median wage, not the minimum wage. But that would mean getting more people back to work to tighten up the labor market, and we just can't do that because of COVID, can we? Remember that the lockdowns were only supposed to require a couple of weeks when they were first enacted. Infection rates were barely affected, though. So why do we keep stacking more chips on a bad bet? For that matter, we need to consider the size of the bets we're making and just how much we are losing in the process. Overall, this package contains another $1.9 trillion of spending so that the lockdowns can continue for the foreseeable future. Congress isn't going to have an effective debate over this package either, not with the majority in both houses passing to the Democrats. The only real arguments are going to be about adding things to the package, and those arguments will largely be in the House, between Nancy Pelosi and the squad, over whether $2,000 means $600 plus $1,400, or $2,000 means $2,000 more than the $600 previously issued, which will push the total price tag on the stimulus to well over $2 trillion, by the way, because money machine go burr. The Senate still has a filibuster to work around, but Chuck Schumer can bypass that pretty easily. Either he can categorize this legislation as a budget reconciliation, against which there is no filibustering allowed, or he can use the nuclear option to kill the filibuster entirely. Silver linings, folks. I personally hate the filibuster. Only certain items are enumerated in the Constitution to require a supermajority in either House of Congress, and in my humble opinion, only those items should require that supermajority. The Constitution allows checks and balances, but the filibuster isn't part of the Constitution and should be permanently abolished. All in all, though, I have to say that this proposal is short on common sense and long on buying the support of American people using money borrowed from their children. Now, I don't know about your kids, but mine really don't want to have to pay off debts that I racked up for the rest of their lives, and I don't blame them in that one little bit. After all, we've already racked up debts in my parents' lifetime, which we can't get paid down, and I shudder to think what would happen if the federal government attempted to declare bankruptcy. So, folks, when your local government lets you know that you can get your proof shots, I suggest that you sign up and get them. At least then, the government will have less excuses to buy your support with your own money.